Why does the ocean's wealth elude some peoples? How does American industry let us enjoy it? Industry on Parade, Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Can you identify this ocean? Its name is really unimportant, for there is actually only one ocean on Earth, fed by the rivers of every continent, washing the shores of 90% of the nations of the world, supplying people with an abundance of goods and services. That is, where the people have the inclination and the ability to avail themselves of what the sea has to offer. Recreation, for example, swimming and boating, with the increased leisure made possible by the greater productivity of modern industry, more and more Americans now have time to turn to these activities for healthful enjoyment. The cool pastime of skin diving has become one of the hottest sports in the country, with hundreds of thousands of new skin divers each year setting out to fetch their own shore dinners. Equipped with breathing masks, tanks of compressed air, and rubber fins for their feet, the skin divers become amphibians, almost as much at home in the water as they are out of it. At last, we can go where the fish go, traveling under our own power as they do, and look upon sights strange and marvelous. The sea is truly a treasure house. Each cubic mile of its water contains $90 million worth of gold. There is enough food in the sea to sustain a human population far larger than that presently living on Earth. Of course, the sea does not always cooperate with those who would unlock its treasures. But with or without cooperation, many men have succeeded. They have succeeded, for example, in making a highway of the ocean's heaving surface. Remarkably, in the big, fast cargo and passenger ships of today, ocean transport is about the most dependable and least expensive of all. For many travelers, ocean transport is also one of the most luxurious and relaxing ways to get from one place to another. But how about that treasure locked up in the sea? This treasure takes many forms. We're all familiar with the various kinds of fish and other seafood netted, trapped, and hooked in ocean waters. They range from the tiny sardine up through herring, cod, tuna, halibut, salmon, and dozens of other varieties. Seafood, of course, is highly perishable, and while in older days it was possible to take care of this through drying and salting to meet the needs of today's market, the food processing industry devised a number of ingenious ways to clean the fish, bone them and pack them, either by canning or freezing. Whaling, once an important source of oil for heating and illumination, again is growing in importance, now supplying ingredients for pharmaceuticals, paint, soap, and many other products. This whale was caught by the Del Monte Fishing Company within sight of San Francisco's Golden Gate. But whale oil is likely to remain forever secondary to another type of oil now being taken from beneath the sea, that type being, of course, petroleum. Forty miles off the Louisiana coast, a converted LST is anchored firmly with its bow up against a drilling rig. Helicopters transport drilling crews back and forth to the mainland. Built high enough to escape the highest tides and strong enough to withstand hurricanes, such offshore rigs are helping the petroleum industry extend our reserves of a most vital natural resource. We find here on a rig of the Humble Oil and Refining Company, an affiliate of Standard Oil Company, New Jersey, that drilling is essentially the same out here as on dry land once you have passed your pipe through a few hundred feet of salt water into the ocean floor.
growing out of the offshore oil drilling rigs is this new form of national defense, the Texas Tower Radar Station, intended to give the nation a few very important extra minutes of warning of potential enemy attack. Here on Georgia's shoal in the North Atlantic, in some of the stormiest waters in the world, our industrial designers and engineers built for the Navy a self-contained, man-made island on stilts, 85 feet above the ocean's surface. Still another product of the sea is sand, fine white sand, here about to be dredged up from the ocean bottom off New York's Long Island, for use as fill in the construction of a solid base for a new superhighway. The sand mixed with water is sucked up and poured into giant hoppers. The water drains off back into the Atlantic. The produce of the sea, as we've said, is widely varied. Here, off Florida's west coast, it's sponges being brought to the surface. Development of the highly popular synthetic sponges now being produced by industry might have been expected to sound the death knell for natural sponges, but not so. Instead, consumer research and advertising of the synthetic variety have created so much interest in sponges in general that demand for natural sponges has reached a new high, too. One of the more unusual crops of the sea is kelp, here being harvested off the Oregon coast. Long known as a rich source of iodine, kelp, or seaweed, has also been found by the chemists of industry to contain elements essential to the manufacture of soaps, shampoos, fertilizer, and other widely diversified products. One derivative of kelp, called algin, is being put to widespread use in the food processing and pharmaceutical industries. Back in the Gulf of Mexico, still another harvest is being gathered as a powerful hydraulic dredge pumps oyster shells by the ton into barges tied up alongside. Here in Galveston Bay, the shells form great reefs, 30 to 40 feet deep, half a mile wide, and 15 to 20 miles long. Like kelp, oyster shells have a wide range of industrial applications. This particular barge load will be processed into grit, an important element in the diet of poultry. At the plant of B. Schwanda and Sons in Denton, Maryland, seashells other than those of the oyster are transformed into buttons. The cutting up of odd-shaped shells into button blanks is accomplished with hollow cylindrical bits spinning at great speed. The blanks are thoroughly cleaned in muriatic acid and water, and then dried, before going on to be sorted for uniformity and color matching, after which they'll be ready to be punched, shaped, and polished into finished buttons of all sizes, styles, and designs. But of all the minerals contained in the sea, the one that occurs in greatest quantity is sodium chloride, or common salt. And yet in some countries, even those bounded by the ocean, salt is quite costly. But in the U.S., salt is about the least expensive element in our diet, thanks to advanced techniques for recovering it either from the ocean or from the beds of oceans that dried up ages ago, as here at the Royal Crystal Salt Company's operation in Utah. Another product created in the sea millions of years ago and only now being utilized is the diatomite we see being mined at Lompoc, California by the Johns Manville Corporation. Diatomite, the fossilized remains of trillions and trillions of microscopic one-cell plants, is used by industry as a filtering agent, as an insulator, and as a component of lacquers, paints, matches, plastics, paper, and insecticides. But nowhere, perhaps, is the treasure of the sea more effectively put to the service of humanity than here in Freeport, Texas, where seawater, at the rate of 400 million gallons a day, is pumped into the plant of the Dow Chemical Company for the extraction of the magnesium it contains. Here, the water is filtered for the removal of marine life. 
Another raw material used in the process, some of those oyster shells we saw being dredged up earlier. First, the shells go to great drums in which they too are washed free of sand and other unwanted materials. Then into long rotating kills that get hotter and hotter as the shells tumble forward. At the end, the glowing chips are mixed with seawater to form magnesium hydroxide. The more concentrated magnesium hydroxide is gathered to the center by rotating blades, then pumped off to another vat. At this point, we have milk of magnesia, just like that you buy at your drugstore. But it will not remain in this state for long. To eliminate excess moisture, the milk of magnesia now will be filtered. It's pumped into this large steel tank, and a filtration unit is lowered into it. Vacuum pulls the liquid through closely woven cloth, leaving a more concentrated compound caked on the outside. There's still some water left in the substance, just enough to permit it to be churned to a flow consistency. Now another big chemical change inside rubber-lined tanks as the milk of magnesia is mixed with dilute hydrochloric acid to form magnesium chloride, one step closer to pure magnesium. The dilute acid brought more water to the compound and the next step is to remove it by evaporation. In a big brick-lined furnace, a tremendous blowtorch shoots a high-pressure flame against a curtain of the liquid, driving off the water as steam. Finally dry, the magnesium chloride moves to a building in which great heat melts it, and electrolysis drives off chlorine as a gas. What remains is the metal we are after. Light, strong, corrosion-resisting magnesium, the metal from the sea. The oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface. They're open and available to all. But only America, with its alert, vigorous, free enterprise system, has benefited so much from this fabulous source of God-given riches. American industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade, a service of the National Association of Manufacturers.